when we talk about relative humidity, relative humidity is actually a calculation. It's not a thing. <laughs> it's not a prime measurement. And everyone thinks they understand relative humidity until you point out that you can have the same relative humidity at many different temperatures. Hello, meat folks. Welcome back to the Meats Pad podcast. It is your hungry and humble host, Phil Bass, uh, here with another episode with somebody who has some uh, very interesting technology that I want to visit about. Um, and uh, the first time I met this individual uh, in person was actually when I was talking about uh, dry aging and um, my eyes were opened and it was it's time to, to bring uh, Neville McNaughton and uh, Sanitary Designs uh, to the forefront. We need to talk about this. So Neville, thank you so much for joining us today. Gracias por la invitación. Yes. Well, so um, first off, I want to I want to learn a little bit or I, I want you to share with uh, the audience a little bit of what Sanitary Designs is, because you you go you have a lot of different um, avenues you can go with this, uh, this technologies that you, you discuss. Um, and then we'll get a little bit more into kind of the the precision nature of what can be done with the technologies that you use here. So mm -hmm. take it away. All right. So <clears throat> SDI, Sanitary Design Industries, as we've called ourselves today, was the outshoot of an organization called Cheese Source, which I set up back in around about 2000 when I decided that I could be, uh, did not need to work for a corporate master. And so I literally jumped ship <clears throat> and had no job and hung up my shingle and said, I'm a cheese consultant. <clears throat> so you have to be very opinionated to do things like that and a little bit arrogant because you think you know enough to be of value to others. And so um, I, I saw these new entrants into the artisan cheese business. They had money, they had passion, but they really didn't have critical knowledge. And so I said, I have some of that critical knowledge and uh, if I could share it, I would love to do that. And so I got together with other independent contractors. And, you know, we have access to grant writers, uh, which often comes before the project even starts. I have access to HACCP and uh, food safety programs, which has got to be in place by the end of the project. I put all that together. And a couple of smart engineers over the year, and we developed ideas and solutions. And so by the time we were done, I've got a few notes here. We would do grant writing, marketing plans, business plans, floor plans, equipment selection. We would design equipment when you couldn't find what you wanted. Um, and then we also showed them how to make cheese. And I never know quite what to call that, but it was manufacturing process to make cheeses and we focused entirely on quality. So today I can tell you that if you buy a vat that's too small, you'll never make money. And if you buy one of this size, you're almost guaranteed to be a success. And that's the kind of critical knowledge that people need to understand is that if you have a 50 gallon vat, you will never make enough money to pay for your time at that cheese vat. If you understand that upfront, you won't be disappointed. If you say, I want to make a profit and hand it on to my children, or I want the weekends off, 600 gallons is the way to make it. So, so that was the cheese part. But um, So that was SDI. We're still more busy with cheese this year and next year than we ever imagined we would be. We've got a lot of projects on the books and a lot going on. But we dream about the day when we can bring more of this to the meat side and so we started off with one key piece of equipment, and that's the aging room. But I see everything changing in the years ahead, Phil. Um, we still use a lot of ceiling mounted evaporators, and I believe they will become a thing of the past at some point because you can't clean them when the room is full of product. And, you know, people cover the product and they say they do, but Really, you have to take it out, and sometimes you have no place to put it. 
Well, and <clears throat> so this is this is a great segue, and and I, and I'm glad you you eventually got to the meat side of things because I'm sure there's listeners out there going, why are we having a cheese program right now? Which I think we need to have a cheese program, but because it goes so well with meat, of course. But um, you mentioned um, your progression from from the cheese industry and how we can apply it to meat, and 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 that's where you and I met was at a dry aging discussion. We were talking about dry aging, and and regularly. Um, when we're talking about dry aging, um, and this is where your, your your technology comes in, we're regularly mentioning relative humidity, and um, I didn't know if I was going to jump over and 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 strangle you and tackle you, or if I was going to jump over and give you a big old hug because um, you you changed my thinking, you changed my paradigm in that room, and I want you to talk a little bit about relative humidity. And this concept of dew point, because once folks start to understand that, wow, what a what a what a mind opening experience. So take it away. You have to promise me that we'll talk a little bit about the the article in the AAMP that had your okay. name on it as well. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> the concept of dry aging began before refrigeration was ever invented, and it was typically seasonal so that you would you'd have a piglet in the spring you'd fatten them up during the summer you'd slaughter them in the autumn and you were hopefully in a region where if you were going to make uh, salami or sausage or simply dry age the meat and hang it you had to have a dew point a vapor pressure that was sufficiently low to allow the water to come out of the product and I remember this very well when I was in France in the Auvergne and they had meat hanging up in the barn, up in the mountains, and it was dry. But it wasn't dry all year round, but it was dry in the winter. And so that preserved that meat on the way through to eating it during the winter and into the spring when you didn't have meat. So when we talk about relative humidity, relative humidity is actually a calculation it's not a thing. <laughs> it's not a prime measurement. And everyone thinks they understand relative humidity until you point out that you can have the same relative humidity at many different temperatures. And so now we have air with different amounts of water in it because the temperature is different, because the ability of the air to hold water changes with temperature. And when you understand that uh, dew point, and dry bulb, which is the temperature, can be used to calculate relative humidity. And you focus on those two elements. If you control them, you will have the relative humidity that you want. And so many systems look at, uh, look at relative humidity and it becomes quite convoluted how you get to control, where the controls that we have are remarkably simple it is possible to control two things in the room with one device called the coil. Your coil temperature in the room really dictates or sets the dew point. The amount of air that flows across that coil determines how much cooling you get. So if you want to change the temperature of the air in the room, you want lots of airflow across the coil to bring the temperature down. But when you get to your target dry bulb, wouldn't it be nice if you could just slow down the fans? Which we do. We stop the fans, we stop cooling the air, and then the, the control continues to focus on dew point. And if the dew point becomes satisfied, we warm up the coil to stop taking out water. So two things occur on our coils. And I say our coils because conventional refrigeration doesn't embrace that air management over the coil for those reasons. And so that's what we did. And it's been very successful. So you you're so to break this down just a little bit, and we're gonna we're gonna go a little bit deeper into this too, but <clears throat> to break this down for the listeners out there, if you go into your into your refrigeration, whatever. Um, you'll see the uh, the unit running, and and then when you reach a temperature, 
it turns off. So it's either on or it's off. And what Neville mentioned to me at, and it took me a minute to finally realize what it is that, that the big difference is, is that you more modulate that uh, velocity or, or maybe I'm using the wrong term, but it's not an on or off situation. It's, it's just constantly trying to make sure that, and tell me if I'm wrong, that the coil is the coldest thing in the room. That's the motto. That's correct. All right. And if we can do that, that's drawing the moisture to it. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. <clears throat> and uh, we're probably going too quickly, but would you, the, the, the article that was in the AAMP that highlighted common defects on carcasses during dry aging, is a is a solvable problem and yet i think the readers of that article said oh it's just a fact of life that's what happens when you have conventional refrigeration what happens is in a conventional room you open the door and the room was at temperature the solenoid was closed and the coil was at the same temperature as the room and the same temperature as the product you roll in a new carcass that's above the temperature of the room and that vapor that's coming off the carcass is looking for a home. And it has an equal home on a carcass or the coil or the wall, the ceiling or the floor. <clears throat> the minute that the solenoid opens because the temperature in the room changed, the coil becomes cold and starts grabbing the moisture. But the damage was done in those first minutes in the room because the vapor was condensing on your carcasses. Remember guys, so, so folks out there listening, it's the reason why so, so many folks either have a little pump or have a drain or something uh, that's coming off of the coils in your refrigeration uh, unit um, because it's pulling water. It's trying to, it, it's capturing water, but it's more pulsatile under our traditional systems. Neville system and Center to D Designs has one that it's, it's constantly the coldest thing in the room. Is that right? Yes. And our sensor is like super sensitive and i do this test with my cheese people <laughs> and we we set up we set up rooms and i tell them to go outside the room and the sensor might be 60 feet away in the room and i'll take a bucket of warm water and tip it inside the door 30 40 50 60 feet away and then i hear them say it moved and they they see the sensor um they on our screen and they say oh it's already changing the dew point in the room is because vapor is what changes. We're trying to focus on vapor pressure. If you know the dew point, you know the vapor pressure. If we put vapor in the room, it changes the dew point and it's quick. And the irony is there can only be one vapor pressure in the room because it's pressure. The whole room has one pressure. And so you tip it in at the door and the sensor at the other end of the room, which we try to put them as far away from the door as possible, and it's instant. People see it on our screen within a split second. So all of a sudden, it opens the valve and makes the coil colder because it's seeing this load. It hasn't even figured out how much load at that point, but it's into it and grabbing that moisture. And as, if there's an uh, unimpeded path from the product to the coil, it will grab that moisture very, very quickly. Yeah. Well, and, and something else, so 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 to go a little bit deeper, and, and I know we're going quick, and this is where, you know, if somebody really needs to <laughs> understand all the all the basics of, of this stuff, call Neville. We'll make give you give him an opportunity to share where, how to get a hold of him. But um I want to talk about vapor pressure a little bit more. Um and um to kind of <laughs> this is gonna be a pun, not intended, but to boil it down is 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 that we're looking for a temperature in which that moisture that's in the carcass or in the subprimals that we're trying to dry age, we're looking for a temperature in which that that moisture wants to leave. And and um, you and I were discussing one time, and and I can't remember who came up with the term. I'm going to give you credit for it, but we're looking for a cold boil essentially. This is a brand new this is a brand new idea guys. We're looking for we're looking for a way to get that moisture out of the meat but at a very very cold temperature for safety reasons and everything. But also very controlled and it's like 
I'm trying to evaporate a pot of water and we can either turn it all the way up um, or we can just leave it there and it's going to evaporate eventually. But we're trying to do it a very controlled, timely manner. And that's that's kind of where this technology is coming in. Did I get some of that right? You did it absolutely right. I give you all the credit for the cold boil because <laughs> you certainly stimulated a great discussion. But it, that's exactly what's happening. We are vaporizing water at very low temperatures because of the reduced vapor pressure around the product. And I think a lot of people, again, often say they understand water activity, but water activity is described as the partial vapor pressure of the product. So the amount of um, free water in the product uh, is what determines your uh, vapor, your uh, water activity. And it's very similar to the relative humidity of the product. It's expressed as a factor of one, not of a hundred, but I'll, uh, I'll, in the cannabis business that we've been involved in uh, somewhat, we are able to set the dew point in such a way that we never over dry that flower. Because the biggest danger is you have perfect flowers and you start drying them, but it over dries. And dehumidifiers only have one dew point. A dehumidifier is set at 32 degrees, right? That's, it, that's how it is. But you don't need 32 degrees to have the right room to dry cannabis. You can actually set it so that it, it's a beautiful curve and it comes in and then it stops when it hits that. And you just let it sit in that condition and it will stabilize and become shelf stable. But it's not 32, which is what happens when you use a dehumidifier or if you use conventional refrigeration, might have a dew point of below 30. It's wrong. And so uh, focusing on and understanding dew point has some real tangible value. So guys, uh, think think about, um, because mo most of the folks listening here um, probably have refrigeration uh, boxes that probably have a lot of moisture in it. And, and, but I want you to think about, um, uh, the, the idea of the dehumidifier, which is really like a compact air conditioning unit. If you ever turn air conditioning on in the summertime, especially in a human environment, it dries the air, it dries that room. And that's kind of the concept, but it's either on or it's off. And that's where, that's where this kind of cool tech, this is where I get excited. The cool technology is that you guys figured out a way to make it. So it's, it's, it has, does it have like an infinite range essentially? Um, yeah. In, um, in, in theory. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so we're doing some work at the moment, but for us, a dew point between 32 and a half <laughs> on upwards because if you go below there you start getting icing up on your coils now and get it and so we've had to introduce defrost cycles and what have you for some of the very low temperature products like dry aged beef so we are um, coming up with strategies to remove ice as quickly as possible so you shed the ice and begin the process but in a perfect world you would avoid a freeze up of moisture on the coil so um, it's it's not infinite, but in the upward direction, of course, when your dew point and your dry bulb are the same, it's 100% humidity. The further apart, the the drier the room. Right. Yeah. Um. Pretty pretty crazy technology. I so okay. You just mentioned the the next thing that I wanted to get into. Um. Uh. You said the drier the room. And uh, before we got on here, um, there there are folks out there that I want to share. Uh with Neville and his team who um, need some help with condensation problems in their plants. So, so if the folks that are, that are still listening um, and, and you were wondering, well, I don't do any dry aging. I, what's this point? What's the point for me guys, this technology um, could very well be a potential solution for condensation in plants. Um, folks that are out there, especially on, on fresh meats, uh, we all know the maintenance guy walking around with a long pole and a towel on the end of it and, 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 and always constantly um, wiping down pipes and any, any, anything that's collecting condensate. And that's a big problem uh, from a food safety perspective. Tell me, do you think we can solve some of the issues with condensation in plants? I'm certain that we can. Um, my vertical air handler that we have 
it has a very high latent ratio. <clears throat> so if I'm running a room, I get about 50% of the energy is going into the removal of water all the time. Whereas standard refrigeration is nowhere near that high. We have also just done a job where we have incorporated basically aging room technology into the production room and the packing room technology at the end of the day after washdown. So the room has been kept cool and they've set the humidity for operations. But when they leave the room, they actually raise the temperature, but hold the dew point. And that lowers the humidity. And all of a sudden, it just sucks the moisture off all the surfaces. One of the dangers, and it's when we make a room very cold, all those surfaces are below the dew point of the ambient air outside the room. Okay. So if you have a corridor that can get where air can come in from outside and it can get to your production room that you might have been holding quite cool or a cutting room, that moist air is coming rushing into the room and it's looking for cold surfaces. And uh, one example was where a group would do, they'd wash up and then they would turn on the cooling to dry out the room. And they, they saw an immediate improvement, but overall it was negative because they made the walls cold, they made the floor cold. It was 80 degrees outside, it was 75% humidity. The dew point's probably about 70 and it comes rushing in and finds walls at 40. Wow, I mean, folks, if, if you're, if, I mean, this is, this is some pretty extensive, this this is this is a lot of science that's happening here but let's think about this so instead of it being just um say a a a a a blast of of air from a fan now it's moving moisture and whatever else might be in that air um toward that cold surface as you've mentioned and if it's under conventional um uh, refrigeration everything's super cold in in that room but if we don't have a place for that moisture to travel to then every surface now is a potential for contaminant that came from the outside is that what you're saying neville i am saying and you try and create a visual so imagine you had a rock in the corner of the production room and you could make it really cold it would gather water and it would run right down the drain in the corner of the room and because that's what we want to do. We want that location, a coil <laughs> or a rock that's super cold, attracting the moisture, but not making the whole room cold. And so that involves getting the air to the coil, making sure the coil is good and cold and not focusing on making the room cold because then it becomes the, the point of condensation. So folks, I've... If you have if you have more interest, I mean, we could probably go on for for an awful long time here. But if you have more interest, I want I want folks to I want Neville to get the opportunity to share his company's um, uh, information. Um, but reach out. I mean, this is um, this is some pretty cool technology. Um, I've passed it up a, a lot of different chains because I believe that this needs to be implemented in a lot of facilities especially i you know it's it's funny we 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 often think about the old facilities that really need the updates and i think i've seen more condensation problem in newer plants um probably because there's so much um uh, smooth surface that you know it attracts the moisture but then it just runs right down and so um this is something that we need to address furthermore um folks that are are looking into um uh, dry aging of meats that need to be at a cold temperature or not necessarily at a cold temperature. And that's what, that's what you just mentioned, Neville, is that um, this is still a technology that it doesn't necessarily have to refrigerate the room, but creates that cold, that cold rock, that cold part of the room that the moisture is going to want to go to. And so now we're, now we're looking into salami room, rooms and, and, and salumi type production where we're trying to pull moisture, but at a very controlled manner can i make one last comment phil about of course, of about course. My, oh, we're not about, done but yes of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. i, I want to again it's all about framing people's minds and by having a modulating coil that's always connected to the job at hand right it doesn't turn off when it's satisfied and turn back on 
we are going to take moisture from your product all the time at the same rate all the time. And we have already been told it leads to less case hardening. Because when you pull hard and stop, <laughs> you are being very brutal to the proteins on that product or the skin or those adjacent to the edge. And you dry them out to the point of no return, right? You denature them and they don't rehydrate. And so it is um, absolutely a better way to pull all the time. And some of the old tech did that by having two coils and they were static coils on a ceiling and they would have half the coils would be on and they would start to attract moisture and they would turn them off and the other coils would turn on to continue to pull. But they also had problems with ice and often at too lower temperatures. And so if you can find that perfect temperature that relates to the dew point relative to the humidity and temperature that you want, you can actually pull the water all the time. And so that produces, and so reports are softest product ever for a water activity. That's a, that's an excellent point too. And I mean, talking about case hardening and, and even, um, it's not a term that we use much in the, in like the fresh dry aged side of things, but it, it's something similar can happen. And, um, and yeah, we definitely need to be trying to control that in a, and, and, and oftentimes the best way of doing that is, well, I'm just going to dry age in a really wet environment. And so, um, but not everybody has that. And so if we can just, um, uh, it, it's almost like we're throwing band-aids at, at a solution where, or at a problem, whereas the actual problem is just the turning on and the turning off of that, that, uh, a coil. And so by having that, and something else that I think about too, is, um, uh, I live out in the country. I live on a well. Um, I know that that well pump will eventually wear out on me because it's turned on and turned off and turned on and turned off. Um, and, uh, and, and it's always, you know, the belief that, well, it's better to just either leave it run or leave it off. Um, and it sounds like this might even be a, 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 a technology that can extend the life of some of these refrigeration or, or um, uh, hu humidity controlling um, uh, mechanisms because it's, it's kind of gradually always on instead of that hard on, hard off. It's part of the reason, Phil, that we switched over to glycol. It's easier to modulate the cold glycol flow through the coil than it is to modulate the ref refrigerant direct expansion. And I'm gonna say it's not impossible we still do it. And so it really depends on the customer. And so we've got a, a great installation out in Washington state where they hooked us up to a rack of refrigeration because to manage the uh, refrigerant through the coil, you do that by controlling the pressure in the coil. The pressure and temperature are inversely related there or not inversely, but they're directly re relative to one another. And when you do that with a single compressor, compressors do not like to be throttled. They don't like to be slowed down. They have an optimum spot where they are very efficient. And so we tried that. And uh, But if you hook us up to a rack, it works perfectly because it's a buffer. The rack has got other loads and all sorts of things, and it doesn't really notice the load. And often we're throttling. It's when you get down to very low loads on a coil and you now are using a condensing unit at 10 percent of its capacity it gets really grumpy <laughs> okay yeah yeah and you have you have to put strategies in place like create a false load so it doesn't overheat and then you move into the inefficient aspect of it's running all the time but a lot of the time it's not doing any work it's just keeping itself from self-destructing yeah <laughs> sure yeah Sounds like shifting gears in a car for those who remember doing that. <laughs> well, I, I think this is, I think it's time to go ahead and start landing this plane. Um, uh, I want to, I want to, you've already mentioned a little bit of, of your background, but I want, I want the, the listeners, I like to do a little bit of autobiographical um, uh, 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 discussion here. Um, and so um, 
tell a little tell the folks a little bit about how you how you got into the food world um if you don't mind that's a tennessee accent right is that or is it more of a carolina accent what's that i'm just my, teasing. my accent yeah <laughs> You you don't know where this accent comes I, from. I know exactly where it is. You 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 had to tell me at one time. But tell the tell the listeners because you came from a land far far away. Yeah, I was um not a very good student, and so I didn't graduate from high school. Disappointed my parents immensely, and uh, I took the first job that came along because I wanted to be employed, and I ended up in a bottling plant um, back in the the very early seventies. And it was a strange time to be looking. It didn't matter where you went. If you didn't like your job, you could walk down the street and get another one. I did two years there, ended up in a cheese plant. And I was fortunate after a, a, a correspondence course, they let me go back to uh, Massey University. So I actually graduated in 1977 with a diploma in dairy technology, which is very much about applied science. I'm not a scientist. I'm not an engineer. I'm, I'm a bit of a hack. But if you put your mind to it, it all makes sense. And as one fellow said, it's all in a book, Neville. Just go read and you'll find it. It's in a book. And so I never forgot that. So I had a great run in New Zealand um, making cheeses other than cheddar, <laughs> right? Because the whole country makes cheddar. And then after 10 years, I started my own company and... Uh, a little company called Capity Cheeses that went on to become a national brand. And uh, while I was working there and had that started, I was offered a position in the US to come across and look for opportunities for New Zealand cheese in North America. And there weren't many. Um, you know, you're, it's restricted by licenses and the types of cheese you can bring in. And when you're making cheese in New Zealand, the grass grows seasonally. You can make cheese for six months. But the market up here is 12 months and it doesn't always fit very well. Um, but I did, I left New Zealand milk products and I ended up working for an enzyme company um, out of the UK. And that's what brought me to St. Louis. And I've been here ever since 1994, we came to St. Louis and I left that company in 2000. And that's when I hung up my shingle and said, I'm going to go be a, a cheese consultant. And uh, you know, I got to say, probably no regrets. It's not been easy, and uh, but it has been a fun time working in cheese and into meat. And there, you know, I see our tech now being applied to many other industries, and that's a good thing. And we are now have a new generation of people at SDI, so they have a future as well. So it's it's uh, as you can tell, it's retirement time for Neville. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I have to say, um, so the the first lengthy conversation that that Neville and I had um, was uh, it it was it was very eye opening to me, and the the uh, terminology and the science that you were bringing in, I finally came out and said, "What are you a physicist?" And uh, and no, very quickly, Neville, you said, uh, "No, I'm a cheesemaker." <laughs> So um, you never know where things are going to take you, but I think you, I think you really said it. It's in a book. Um, open your mind. Don't be afraid to do some research on your own. Don't be afraid to do some learning and get out there and learn from those who know. Um, and, uh, and, and Neville, you're definitely a, a, a different breed. Um, you're able to, to really teach yourself. I think you've, you have um, a really cool technology. I want folks to be able to reach out to you. What's the best way to do that? Well, we do have a website, and so uh, Sanitary Designs is always there. It's going to be completely relaunched again here in the next couple of months. Okay. Um, I'm Neville at sanitarydesigns.com. Anytime. I tell people, call me anytime, because if I'm not here, you don't need me. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, the milk's running down the drain, so right. you're going to figure it out one way or another. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I, we don't think we're hard to find, although – we do notice that it's amazing how many people just don't know we're out there. And so, yeah. yeah. Well, um, it's been a pleasure getting to know you. I, I hope that we can continue to, to learn together. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time to share with us here at Meatspad. So thanks All a lot. Right. Neville. All right. Thanks a lot, Phil. Take care. You bet.